this is Bobby Rempe from Cleveland, Ohio, and you're listening to Barbecue Let's Central. Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Barbecue Central Show. This is a show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling, originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast, and once again in 18 years, the football capital of the universe, at least in Cleveland. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday's Live Fire Fun and Frivolity Show. If you want to take part in the show during this New Year celebration, here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, at BBQ Central Show. Everything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening coming up in about 12 minutes from now. It's the first Tuesday of a new month, hell, a new year. And you know, because we missed him last month, we have to catch up with the guy that created How to Barbecue Right, the pitmaster of Killer Hogs Barbecue. Malcolm Reed will be joining us, and we'll catch up with him, see what happened last month, how his hunt has gone. Best Christmas gift of 2020, what he's looking forward to in 2021, goals and benchmarks for the YouTube channel, for the new YouTube channel, for the brick and mortar store, you name it. Got to be a lot of things going on in the world of how to barbecue, right? Plus, we will talk about fads of 2020 come and gone, and we will also talk about what he might be predicting for 2021, as live fire fads might be. And by the way, I have to tell you, 2021 already feverishly coming to a close, <laughs> as you can only imagine. So Malcolm Reed will kick it off. Then we will move 35 past the hour. You would recall one of the most outrageous and shocking revelations, not even statements, but I'm going to say revelations of 2020 was after years of pushing the sous vide agenda ad nauseum and perhaps recklessly, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com decided somewhere in the first quarter of last year to back off of it. And he didn't back off like going 100 miles an hour to 80. He did the old Maverick and Top Gun, hit the brakes and the MiGs fly right by. Nose swung up. Everybody blew past him. Like he stopped that hard on it and said, you know what? Maybe sous vide isn't that good on everything all the time. Especially when it comes to steaks. And I couldn't believe it. Because I had mentioned the last couple weeks as well as we had gone over that, both from a year in review 2020 last week and then two weeks ago we did Best Sound Bites and both were sprinkled with the sous vide stuff from Meathead. And I said, geez, like that's the only reason I use sous vide. If I have a really thick-ass steak and I have other things that I'm going to be cooking, and I want to pay attention to other things, to me, it's perfect. I stick that thick-ass steak into the bag, put it in the water, set it at the temperature I want, and I don't have to think about it again until I get the grill hot, do the quick sear on either side, and away it goes. And I know it's perfect on the inside. That way I can focus my other attention on some of the other main dishes that might be going on. For example, the item I had been using in the past few weeks was cast iron pizza and then a thick steak to join. Perhaps steak and pizza don't usually go together in your house, but they do in my house. And I wanted to make sure that the pizza was hitting all the right marks and the steak was not an afterthought because it was a ridiculously great thick-ass cowboy ribeye from Snake River Farms, courtesy of Jason Kaplan. 
executive producer of the Howard Stern Show, my friend. So I didn't want to screw that up and the pizza. I would rather screw the pizza up from a cost perspective and know that the steak was going to be right. Maybe that could be the catch-all or the saving grace if it all the chips were down. But that wasn't the case. Anyway, long way to go to sit here and say that Meathead has backed off. And in order to delve back into where sous vide currently sits today with somebody who is well experienced, he's written an ebook on it, he's got a blog, he's got a podcast all about it. It's called Fire and Water Cooking, first timer of the show. Darren Wilson will join me at 35 past. And we'll talk about all of where his fascination for sous vide came from and what he thinks best uses are, if he thinks, if he agrees or disagrees with Meathead. Far be it from anybody to disagree with Meathead. Me occasionally, but sometimes under protest. John Solberg, 100% disagreeing with Meathead on every turn. But outside of that, you don't really see a lot of people taking Meathead to task. So we'll see what Darren has to say 35 past the hour. And that'll wrap the first. Then we'll go to the second hour. And of course, not only is Malcolm a first Tuesday of the month guest, but the guy that we know that is now, well, two plus million subscribers on YouTube producing three, no less than three cooking videos a week. It is Sam, the cooking guy, rejoining us in 2021. And we have a lot of similar topics that we'll be talking about, Sam, that we're going to be hearing Malcolm discuss, such as most popular video of 2020, least popular video of 2020, what he thinks might be the new 2021 food trend as we are just getting underway here in Q1 of 2021. And we'll have Sam for a segment, maybe a little bit of a carryover, but I also want to make sure that I leave plenty of time so let's call it the 35 past the hour in hour number two for a Mike Mills tribute or look back or eulogy, whatever you want to call it. I had mentioned last week, it has been exactly one week. Uh, Mike passed away in the morning on Tuesday of last week. And I had referenced that made a, a quick social media post about the last time I sat down with him. And it's been a couple of years when we were down at the NBBQA, the first and only time the show was technically traveled and done live shows. We did that in Fort Worth and was lucky enough at the end of the first day to land Mike Mills, courtesy of his daughter, Amy. And we sat down and did a lot of look back. We did a lot of barbecue business talk, and we talked about where his legacy is and what he would like to leave for legacy. And I went back through and chopped up six or seven sound bites that I wanted to play for you of various lengths. Just if you're not familiar with Mike, if you're just getting into the live fire industry, or if you're just getting into barbecue, maybe you're just getting into the restaurant industry. Mike was a unique individual in that he touched all of the different areas of the live fire industry. He was successful at running restaurants. He was successful at consulting about running restaurants. He was successful in Barbecue competitions, having won Memphis in May three different times. Uh, we'll reference that in the look back. And a well-respected person in the industry, somebody that was eager to have a conversation with you, whether you were just a fan of his or a fan of the restaurant or just a fan of Live Fire, it didn't matter. He was ready to talk to you and have that barbecue conversation with you wherever you were. He was ready to do it. So, if you're not familiar with him, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this will give you a pretty good insight on the person that he is and the history that he has had and the experience he has accumulated over the decades as well. By the way, Barbecue Hall of Famer, undoubtedly. So that's what you have lined up coming at you. Malcolm Reed, 14 past, or next segment, 35 past, the first hour, Darren Wilson from Fire and Water Cooking, Sam the Cooking Guy at 1014, and the Mike Mills look back. As we round out the show, don't forget, you can follow me socially at BBQ Central Show on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and Snapchat, Facebook and Twitch slash BBQ Central Show and on YouTube as well. Slash R.D. Rempe uh, referring to Mike Mills. I did want to do a fact check on myself from last week. I had mistakenly said during my uh, brief alert that he had passed away at the top of the show last week that he had won the Jack Daniels three times. That was incorrect. He had won Memphis in May three times, as I had just mentioned, not the Jack. However, he did win the Jack as well. 
both the competition and he also won the sauce uh, event as well at some point. That might have been in the same year, but I know he won the Jack as well and also won Jack for sauce. So I wanted to make that uh, correction on error. Listener feedback from shows. Uh, we got Tim from Wisconsin. Greg, love the second hour of the show from two weeks ago. I enjoyed hearing the bits from the past year and then getting new reactions from each of the panel members. Well done. Tim, thank you very much for writing in and letting me know that you like the bets bits from two weeks ago. A lot of folks wrote in and said they couldn't believe that I actually carried a two-hour show talking about shows that I had all of last year. Talking for two hours was quite a task. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm happy to have Malcolm help me carry the weight here in about two or three minutes from now. He's in the green room, locked and loaded for his first appearance of 2021. I'll talk to you quickly about the newest sponsor of the show, Primo Grills. PrimoGrill.com is the website, not grills. PrimoGrill.com is the website. Now, if you've heard about them, but you're not familiar with the visual, hit up the website, check them out. It's a ceramic cooker, yes. What's the difference? Where all the other ceramic cookers are round in appearance, the thing that sets the Primo apart is its oval shape. Not round, it's oval. This gives you the opportunity for two, <clears throat> true two-zone cooking. has the dividers, so you can put coal on one side. You can keep the left watching on the other side. Keep it all empty for that true two-zone cooking that everybody talks about but hard to get when you have a traditional ceramic round cooker. They have an XL. They have an XL Jack Daniels edition. They have a large. They have a junior. Now, if you can't get over the fact of a oval ceramic, you can't get it out of your head, you need the round. They have a round version as well. They're here to satisfy. They also have an extra large gas ceramic cooker. If you can get that in your mind, it's a ceramic cooker got gas burners in it. Best of both worlds. Again, it's primogrill.com. Primogrill.com. Nick Bauer and the gang over there. New sponsor of the show. Happy to have them board here for 2021. And we will be right back with the guy that co-created How to Barbecue Right and the pitmaster of Killer Hogs. Malcolm Reed joining me. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Hey, welcome back. This portion being brought to you by the Barbecue Guru, creators of automatic pit temperature control technology, sellers of ceramic cookers with built-in power draft fans called the Monolith. And accessories to make your barbecue and grilling life easier. Visit bbqguru.com for more information or call them at 800-288-GURU. The Barbecue Guru continues to be a breakthrough in barbecue technology. All right, joining me now, somebody on YouTube who has amassed since this past Saturday 1.15 million YouTube subscribers bringing in a large live audience here to the show this evening. Of course, I am talking about friend of this show, Malcolm Reed. Hey, Malcolm, how are you, pal? Happy New Year, Greg. How's it going, man? Uh, we are absolutely fabulous, Malcolm. Happy New Year to you as well. And you know, we were corresponding a little bit before we jumped on here a couple days ago. And uh, to me, it's always like uh, a year or two with my memory. Uh, sometimes it's two to three years. And I was like, is this the start of our second year? And you said, no, I believe we're starting our third year. I went back and checked. You're absolutely right. We are starting third year Malcolm Reed leading off the show on a Tuesday. I can't believe it, but I appreciate the fact that you show up here every month and we chat barbecue. Yeah, man. You know, I, I've always enjoyed your show, so it's been a, a real pleasure to, to, to be on here and to talk with you. And I, 
three years, man, we can't beat that. It doesn't seem like it. There must be a lot of things going on in the live fire industry, Malcolm, where we can sit down for 36 times and uh, have a non-repetitive barbecue conversation. We're not talking about how to do pork butt every month and uh, brisket. I mean, we're talking about a variety of topics. <laughs> that's right. You know, and that's one thing I like about your show. You never know which way it's going to go. We can have a plan, but... But we just let it, we just let the conversation take us whichever way you know it goes. That's right. So if you have any questions for Malcolm, you want to jump in tonight, uh, feel free to email me, Greg at the BBQ Central Show dot com. Or I mean, it's never happened yet, but we're totally up for phone calls. So if you want to call into the show, we can mix you in two one six two two zero zero nine six six, and we'll get you up there. By the way, if you call in and you hear your uh, you hear the show going on, just know that like you're ready to go. So. There's no screeners or anything like that, and then I'll dump you when you're done with the question. Uh, Malcolm, I had led the show off with it for uh, a few minutes, and it wasn't about the sous vide stuff, and maybe I can ask you about that here in a second, but I had mentioned that a week ago in uh, uh, Tuesday morning, Mike Mills passed away from 17th Street, and uh, you know he's a, a guy that I knew you know, cursorily, had him on a few times here on the show. As I had mentioned, I uh, met him in person for the first time down at MBBQA in Fort Worth. Uh, a few years ago and had a great conversation that I'll replay some bits of here in the second hour as we close out the show. But uh, what did you know about Mike and what are some of your fond remembrances of him as, you know, everybody seemed to jump in and say what a great guy he is? Yeah, you know, I've, I've known Mike for, you know, several years. He, he's kind of been a one of the guys that, that, that me and Waylon both look up to as far as our barbecue mentors. And I had the you know the pleasure to go up to two of his classes over the years. I went to his business of barbecue class back when I first started doing this, and uh, you know him and Amy just do an outstanding job. And then I got a chance to go back to his Hogapalooza event one year, and I, I've got to you know spend some time with Mike over the years. Um, he was such a good guy, and you would never meet a, a more genuine person that just loved barbecue and loved helping people. That was one of the big things that I took away from hanging out with them and learning from. From Mike was, you know, they, they believe in, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. That was a philosophy. I know they didn't coin the phrase, but they stood by that philosophy. And that, that meant to me that um, they were, you know, they knew even though we were in competition doing different things, that it wasn't about the competition. It was about of us all working towards a goal of, of helping everybody out and making people better and, and helping them in the, you know, with their careers or, or with their business, whatever whatever they could do to offer some good advice or help along the way, Mike's just been one of those type of people, man. It's it's more than more than barbecue with him. I'm sure he's for, he forgot more barbecue than than I'll ever know. But he was just an all around great guy. It is uh, uh, one of the one of the funny quick quick, quick funny story, Greg. Yeah. And I guess it's one of the first things I remember about Mike. This was early in my Memphis and May career when we used to have a big party. Uh, he was hanging out with Mr. Pat. You know, him and Mr. Pat were super tight. They yeah. were teammates and, and, and you know, friends for, for life. But um, when we had our big party, we always had a big DJ set up with speakers pointed out. It was kind of like a block party to us. We were all packed in there with Mike and Pat's team was right across from us. And so they they graciously come over and got my attention and, and taught me that how much better the speakers would sound, the music would sound if we would actually point our speakers towards our booth inside <laughs> instead of having it out towards the street. <laughs> You guys were like entertaining everybody else. You were the you were the disco party for everybody else besides you guys. That was right. Yeah. You know, we were there to party back then, and it, it, I, I quickly learned. You know, as I got older, that that wasn't where it's at for me. <laughs> is it a is it a unique person that is able to be successful at restaurants? And I mean, certainly we could you know probably list off you know uh, two, three, four folks, but I mean there doesn't seem to be a, a plethora of folks that are great in competition barbecue that also have great success in the restaurant side of things. That's two different things, right? I mean, competition barbecue is typically one bite. You're trying to go over the top and press the judges. It's not stuff you would normally make. And then you turn around and the day job is making barbecue that is going to appeal to the widest variety of folks, probably the antithesis of what competition barbecue would be. And yet he seems to hit the mark on both. The other thing is, you know, how you're able to keep that first round of barbecue as good as the ninth round of barbecue and not get caught up in the holds or the ebbs and flows. I think that's where a lot of barbecue restaurants die or get trashed is it's really good in the beginning, but if it's not coming right off the pit and they don't know how to do that hold properly, the quality dissipates quickly. 
Oh yeah, that's and that's one thing Mike really understood that you know the competition barbecue to him was kind of the hobby, kind of something fun to do. But I think his you know his business was his his livelihood, and and nobody did it like him. I mean, to, you know he he loved Murfreesboro, the the town there, and and it was all about that part of Illinois, and and you know he he had endeavors you know all across the country. I mean New York, Vegas. I mean he was yeah. he, you know, he had he had different. Different things going on where he'd helped so many people too that you know a lot of the people don't even know how many people he helped that that have restaurants now. So, all that he was he was instrumental in what he's done for 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 uh, barbecue uh, restaurants and for competitors. I mean, you can go back and trace back the Memphis and May guys now. All of them have ties to to what Mike was doing. Malcolm Reed joining me here on the show from How to BBQ Right dot com. Malcolm, let's look back. Last month, we missed you because you uh, were off hunting, I believe. That's something that you like to get into. I mean, I'm not a big hunter myself. I think we've been over that a couple different times. But were you successful in getting anything? Or, like, what's the... Is the goal to be outside and relax and recharge? And then, oh, by the way, if you get to knock something off, that's a benefit? Or is the goal to get out there and get something? And then the side benefit is the relaxation and hanging out. My part is just being able to relax and kick back and be outside and enjoy, you know, and enjoy the winter. I love it. Um, this this year, I haven't, you know, I haven't shot anything. I've taken my son a bunch, and he's 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 had some good luck. He's killed a couple bucks and a doe. So uh, being to spend, being able to spend time, quality time with Michael, and you know, and teach him about the outdoors and about hunting and and about the game and preparing. It. That's you know, I've got a freezer full of deer meat now, so I've got a you know, a ton of recipes that I can do and stuff we can, you know, live off of all year. So is there a cut or a piece that is outside of the norm? When I hear deer or venison, it's always like back straps uh, or, or loins. Maybe that's one and the same thing, but is there something outside of that realm that is just as good that people don't know or aren't familiar with? Oh, the neck roast, man. A lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people discard the neck, but there's good, there's two good roasts on each side of it. And when you cook that down, man, it makes some of the best tacos you've ever had. You know, you, you just kind of braise it down, put some smoke on it, and then braise it down, break it down to where it's, you know, like really, really good um, seasoned meat. And it's real lean. It's, it's really good for you. Is that a video that you're going to be working on, or have you done one of those already? I haven't done that when I need to. That's that's one I can add to my list. You know, that's something we just cook, and usually we have it when we're, when we're at deer camp or something like that. But that's definitely one I need to do a video on. Best Christmas gift that you got last month? Oh man, Santa Claus bought me a drone. Oh so yeah, I'm, I'm really, I haven't got. It's been <laughs> kind of windy, so I haven't got to fly it much. But I got one of these uh, Mavic Air twos. It's kind of a real, you know, right, fits in the palm of your hand, but it's got an awesome camera on it. I've <laughs> flown it some and kind of took some shots of you know behind my house and things like that. But I hope to incorporate it with some of the shots for a video or something. I was going to say, is this a gift for you that is also going to be a gift for Rochelle to do some like drone videos while you're cooking? <laughs> well, hey, you never know. If I can teach her how to fly it, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Having you like buzz along as you're working the Traegers and, uh, you know, cutting shots. I mean, I, I always think that the drone shots are some of the coolest because they're very steady, but then you can raise them up and down, get those different eye levels. So I'll be interested to see how you... Uh, incorporate those, or if you do incorporate those in the videos through the course of 2021. Um, I saw from a video or from a recipe standpoint, uh, there were a couple ones that you had done. You did the the big uh, prime rib or uh, the roast beast, I think you were calling it, like uh, like the Grinch. So, uh, and you did that in the in the smoker. And you know, I'm wondering is as folks would shy away from that because they're under the impression that there might be a heavy smoke flavor. Uh, so a is that the case? And then uh, for folks that are worried about that, how do you work alongside to make sure that you're not imparting too much smoke on a piece of beef? I mean, if you've never had a smoked prime rib, Greg, you haven't lived yet. Because if you think it's good in the oven, man, when you just put that essence of smoke on it, and you don't want to oversmoke one, that's for sure. Anything you oversmoke is going to taste bad. But a little smoke, you know, it goes perfect with beef. I mean, you think we do brisket, we do the beef ribs chuck roast i mean why not do a prime rib i mean it, it, it's perfect it's really made for the smoker it gets you can control the temp because you're not cooking as hot and fast you're putting a little smoke on the outside and you don't need a lot of seasoning i mean i, I was mainly salt and pepper on that one <laughs> is all it took salt pepper and thyme that's uh, that's it you know i remember 10 years ago the way to cook a prime rib or a rib roast was putting it in the oven hitting it with a ton of heat right off the top 
and then maybe backing it off to a more traditional 350 to get you to wherever you were looking for. And now it just seems that uh, when you do something of this size, you give yourself the extra time and you go low and slow to work it up so you're not going to overshoot. Even in the carryover, I mean, if you're still pulling a little earlier so you can allot as it rest to get it to whatever your target temp. Uh, I don't know. I typically am accounting for like a, a six to eight degree rise once I get it out of the cooker myself. But uh, is that a similar thought for you? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of that high heat at first was because you needed some of that to get any kind of color at all on it mm. while it's on in the oven. But when you put it on the pit, it's going to get some of that. The, the, the color is going to come from that chemical reaction with the smoke and the temperature you're cooking it at. So it allows you to back those temps off and really not overshoot it. That's the big thing when you're cooking a prime rib. Man, you got this whole expensive roast. You don't want to overcook it. So I'm like you. I give it, you know, six to 10 degrees of carryover just in case. But usually, usually it goes about seven, six to seven degrees. I usually try to stop them about 120, 122, something like that. Let it carry over towards medium rare. But then you have it, you know, it's such a big piece of meat. There's going to be some center parts that are more rare, and there's going to be some out towards the end that are a little more done. So that's the great thing about cooking one of those is, is you know, you can find something for everybody. Malcolm Reed joining me here on the show. Let's talk about 2021 goals for the various entities of uh, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Let's start with the YouTube channel first. Do you guys sit down as the year starts to wind down or as the year turns and say, we're going to plan out three months or six months, or do you go a year uh, out to see what kind of goals you might like to hit and what are some of those that you look to hit in 2021? Well, yesterday was our 2021 goal day. So you hit that question just right. All right, perfect. Um, with YouTube, the first goal we said we wanted to do, we wanted to try to do 40 videos this year on YouTube. Wow. So that's a pretty, you know, pretty big endeavor for us with our schedule. But we're going to shoot for that. We're going to try to get, a, 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 we want to hit 1.5 million subscribers, hopefully. So we've got a little ways to go on that. I think it would, about 400 maybe or something like that. Yep. Almost 400, you said earlier, yep. to get there. So I think that's doable. And then, um, we're going. We're going to. You know, we do a podcast too. So we're gonna. We've been putting our podcast on our our main recipe, how to barbecue right. What we're going to do is we're going to split that off, and we're going to start our own podcast channel. And it may it may not be a good call. I don't know, but we're going to just focus on recipes on the how to barbecue right channel, and then the how to barbecue right podcast channel will be all the all the fun stuff we talk about. Kind of like you know um, that that's where you hang out with us and see how our week went, how the recipes went. It's just another avenue for us to kind of to me and Shell to get together and have guests on and stuff. I think it's a great additive or supplement to the video. So for the folks that are, you know, just tuning in or they're just finding you, maybe they got a barbecue for Christmas or a pit of some sort, and they're starting to troll through YouTube because that's what everybody does nowadays when they're looking at something new and they want advice to get on YouTube. They're going to find you undoubtedly. But if you haven't seen or heard the podcast, like to me, I like because I'm a podcast guy, of course, but I love getting all the inside stuff and hearing the inside baseball talk between you and your wife. And, you know, she's pissed because editing took too long or she didn't get the right sound or the shot. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I like to hear. And then it almost makes watching the finished YouTube product even more magical for me because in my mind, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking about what you guys were talking about, you know, post shot. And now we're watching it happen. Uh, as we're watching on the YouTube channel. So I think the, the podcast is is really cool. I mean, do you do you talk about download numbers and stuff like that? I mean, I get you. I don't watch the, the podcast video on YouTube. I actually download it and listen to it as it's traditional podcast, like a lot of folks listen to my show versus a live video. So do you talk specifically about podcasts and numbers and downloads and how to grow that too? Um, well, we really hadn't talked about the analytics of it. We I mean, we kind of track it by how many views and stuff we're getting, you know, if people watch it, but we, we don't really get hung up on it. I mean, it, you know, as long as one, one or two people's watching it, we're okay. So, uh, you know, it, it, it really, it's, it's, it's been great therapy for me at Shell because we get to talk out, you know, all the differences we have when we were, when we were shooting these videos. Cause when it's just me and her, you know, it's, it, it may look like we're clicking on all cylinders when we're doing it, but there's times when I'm sure she wants to choke the crap out of me. And, and so it lets us work all those frustrations out and we just let people listen to us talk about it. So I try to keep it humorous if, the best I can. I mean, it seems like you guys get along swimmingly every single time. So, you know, if there's tension, you've certainly done well to cover it up and I'm certainly not picking up on anything. So, you know, kudos to you guys on that part. 
The other thing is... I'm a lover, not a fodder. That's right. I heard that. (laughs) We have the same mindset on that. Happy wife, happy life as well uh, in this house. So uh, the other thing that's, you know, new, uh, maybe a couple months old, is that brick and mortar store, Malcolm store uh, out there uh, with the How to Barbecue Right headquarters. So uh, what's happening with that currently and what kind of a, you know, first quarter plan do you have for that? Well, we got it up and running, um, you know, right after the uh, first of November. So we could kind of get some, get some holiday stuff going on. And we turned, we, you know, we, we, we quit doing our podcast after we did that last episode, I guess there in December and the podcast room was kind of turned into the gift basket central. <laughs> so we did a lot of gift baskets and stuff like that, but we're now, you know, getting back into where we've kind of got a game plan on, on how we're going to, you know, run the store and the hours we're going to be open. And, you know, we're, we're still learning. There's, you know, we tried a lot of products out, so we're, we're trying to figure out what people want to buy. Um, we're, we're kind of have limited space cause it's small. So, um, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be trying out different products. Of course we have all our stuff, but we try to sell some other stuff too. The, the stuff that guys would want the stuff that I like. So that's, that's kind of the, the, go, the focus and the goal of that little shop is it's kind of part men's gift shop boutique, I guess you would say, or, Boutique, or just a, yeah. a, a kind of like my favorite stuff, basically. So if, if you're in the area and you want to drop in and kind of see what I'm into, you can come look at the shop. Malcolm, a couple of questions before I let you go tonight. We got a couple minutes left. Uh, 2020, as you look back, was there one particular live fire trend that popped off to you as being the leader as the year closed out? Um, you know, it seemed like the state game was the big thing. Um, you know, everybody was into cooking steaks because that was where the most contests were. So I think you're going to see that continue with the SCA really, really, you know, keeping on moving forward like they are. They're, they had some super fast growth and seems to be doing really well. Um, we closed out the end of the year with the with the whole hog cook at an SCA event. So that was exciting to see them adding different meats other than just ribeye steaks. So I look for more of that in 21. So, I'm, you know, I'm hoping they have another one of those hog cooks. So, I mean, why they can break, you know, break out the hog, whole hog pit again. But, uh, uh, like you said, live fire cooking, I think that's a big thing too. People are really getting into cooking over actual fire instead of having, you know, traditional grills. I'm seeing a lot of these fire pits or discadas and things like that. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited about doing some live fire cooking myself. So when you look into this year, do you think that there's going to be a weird trend that, we're not familiar with right now or that you've heard about just kind of spooling up. That's going to be the next big thing this year. You know, I haven't seen anything just crazy. Uh, I know, you know, Wagyu beef seems to be the, all the talk right now. It's trending on all the hashtags and everything. I just got a, a bunch of it myself. So I'm going to be doing so. That's all you got an A5 I got a, I got too, a Japanese right? A5. Yeah. Was that? I'm you, got, you got an A5? I thought I saw. I did. Yes, uh, Kevin from down in the butcher shop sent me a little surprise after Christmas gift. I've never tried it, so I'm going to do that tomorrow. So hopefully, I'll be having something on Instagram or TikTok or you know, I never know where that's going to pop up. Shell's going to record it. We're going to see how it turns out. Well, that's going to be the lead question as we get into February: is uh, the full breakdown of how you cooked it, and more importantly, what the taste was compared to where price would be for you know the folks that might spring on that, and if you think. They both pan out in the positive, so uh, we will start. There it's gonna have to be February. awful good. A two hundred dollar steak, man. Oh no shit! It better <laughs> better be the best steak you've ever had. I hope, right? That's right. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, this is Malcolm Reed from How to BBQ Right. You can find his podcast as well. Go over to the YouTube, subscribe if you haven't already. We're looking to hit one point five by the end of the year or more. We'll take more, of course. And you can find him right here the first Tuesday of every month. Malcolm, always appreciate the time, and we'll look for you again in February. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it, Greg. Hey, go Browns. Go Browns. That's right. Let's hope go Browns. Oh, my goodness. From your lips to God's ears, it's Malcolm Reed right here on the show. And we'll see. The Browns continue to drop like flies with the COVID. So I am absolutely worried about the Browns' realistic chances of winning the playoff game. We'll see. We'll keep it positive. I'll talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grills before we get to Darren Wilson from Fired Water Cooking as we broach, rebroach the sous vide topic again. Uh, Green Mountain Grills, some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. If you're looking for a new pellet cooker because you just came into a large amount of cash for your holiday season, it's burning a hole in your pocket, and you know you want a pellet cooker, I would humbly suggest a Green Mountain Grill. Now you have a couple different options to choose from. If you don't need tech, 
If you don't want Wi-Fi connectivity, none of that stuff, then the Choice Line is the right one for you. You can save some money and still get a great cooker. Both the Jim Bowie and Daniel Boone come in a Choice Line. Now, if you want Wi-Fi connectivity, if you want to use an app to control temperatures and... Once you hit certain temperature or time benchmarks, automatic adjustments, custom recipes that you can set within the app. PrimeLine is what you're going to want to look at. That has Wi-Fi connectivity, has app connectivity, has two internal meat probes, has look-in windows on the main cooking chamber and on the pellet hopper. And it, both of them have the uh, DC power connection, of course, or the AC. Now, if you're looking for something to take on trips, Sporting events as they start to roll out. Davy Crockett is definitely the one you want to take a look at. You're not sacrificing an incredible amount of capacity for portability. So make sure you check that one out too if you're looking for something to take around town. But for the Jim Bowie and the Daniel Boone, both choice and prime, you can get the pizza oven insert. Got to get that. I love the pizza oven insert. Super fun. Nothing better than a high heat pizza party. Fabulous. Go get it. GreenMountainGrills.com is the website. Find a dealer near you and then go from there. GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. We are back. Stick around. We'll be... Huh? Stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. Speaking of pellet cookers, you got to fire those things, right? You know who you're going to have to check out? Cookingpellets.com, back on board 2021. Your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit cookingpellets.com for more information or to purchase. You can also buy on Amazon.com as well. As I'd mentioned in the open, one of the most popular topics on the show over the past few years has been sous vide. In fact, Last year in 2020, as I had mentioned, one of the biggest revelations was made about sous vide by one of its former biggest champions, Meathead from AmazingRibs.com, when he said that sous vide isn't that good for everything and specifically steaks. My next guest will be able to talk about this topic in depth as he hosts the Fire and Water podcast, runs the website with the same name. Let's go to the hotline and welcome first timer to the show, Darren Wilson, joining me. Hey, Darren. Hey, how are you, Greg? I'm fabulous. Appreciate you making time for the show this evening, Darren. And before we jump into the sous vide stuff, a little background on you since it's your first time in. If the folks aren't overly familiar with what you have going on, uh, certainly we'll get into the sous vide portion of that in a few minutes. But uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, where your home based out of? And how did you get into live fire cooking? Well, actually, I'm down around uh, Lakeland, Florida, which... Um, there's a big uh, barbecue community down yes, here, of course. You, you probably know Ch- Chad Ward lives not too far from where I am. Never heard of him. <laughs> and uh, Danielle's not too far and uh, Diva Q. And, but um, I, I'm a banker by trade. And this is one of my hobbies is cooking. And barbecue is a big um, a big uh, you know, hobby of mine. I got into it big time about eight years ago. You know, just home. I, I never you know, cooked on the competition circuit or anything like that. But um, just, you know, cooking at home for my family, uh, experimenting. I've always cooked uh, probably when I was 16 years old, I think it was my first job in a restaurant. <laughs> Started washing dishes, but then I got moved into the kitchen. I worked in restaurants uh, cooking for about 10 years, and I decided it uh, just didn't pay the bills, you know, for a growing family. So I got into the banking business, but I always loved cooking, always tried new things. And um, about, like I said, about eight years ago, I got big time into barbecue. You know, I bought a bunch of different kinds of cookers, kind of settled in on Kamado cookers for a while. And then I just started, you know, experimenting with a different mixing you know, the barbecue with different cooking methods. And I kind of stumbled upon the sous vide mm. uh, method, watching a YouTube video um, from one of the bigger barbecue YouTube guys, uh, Greg uh, Mervich of uh, Ballistic Barbecue. And um, I just, one of these videos I watched, he was, he cooked the brisket sous vide and then smoked it. And um, that I, I had never heard of sous vide before. So it kind of got me, uh, opened up my eyes a little bit and I uh, started doing a lot of research and I kind of delved into it. 
uh, started, you know, experimenting on my own and mixing it with different, you know, types of uh, foods and then kind of nailed um, a lot of the how how barbecue could work really well with it. <laughs> so um, and it just kind of grew from there. I started out just, you know, with a Facebook group. Then I delved into doing a little bit of YouTube videos on it and then started a podcast myself, which you were a guest on not too long ago. I appreciate you being on. Yeah. But um, yeah, and it's just kind of grown from there. I've kind of, you know, other people kind of touch on CV, you know, even Meathead, he kind of touches on it, but Meathead's got a lot going on and we're going to discuss kind of what Meathead said. <laughs> well, but, um, let's, you know. let's go ahead and, and hit that just for a second. You know, I had mentioned in the introduction, sure. uh, both just as I was leading you in and then also introduction to the show that me had had made quite a statement on the show last year when he admitted that sous vide wasn't that good for everything. And he specifically identified steak as being something that was definitely not worth it. So what's your take generally on sous vide? Is it something that, you know, where a couple of years ago, it seemed to be, I remember, you know, two or three years ago, this is what we were talking about. It was you know, sous vide was going to be the biggest thing in whatever year that ended up being that we were just trending into. And it did seem to gain quite a bit of steam, but I had said by the end of that first quarter that I thought by the end of that year, if anybody was talking about sous vide, I would have been surprised. I think I was more right than Meathead was. He seemed to think that it was continuing to trend up for the last couple of years, but how have you seen its evolution since you've been following it? I think it's still going up. The one of the things that I know when we're talking about what Meathead said, it's not all steaks that it's really not good for. His comparison was to reverse sear. And he, he prefers a reverse sear like on a ribeye. So one of the things with sous vide, you got to understand there's multiple things that it does. It just doesn't cook just to a perfect temperature. It actually can tenderize the meat at a perfect temperature. So one of the things I focus on is showing people how they can take a more tough meat like uh, London broil, a top round, a brisket, or beef ribs, and use sous vide and incorporate it with the smoker and grill to make a medium rare, tender beef ribs or brisket and still get smoke to it. So one of the things with sous vide, it's not really a complete cooking method all in itself. It really, you need to finish off the meat. So everybody knows if you cook a steak sous vide, you take it out of the bath, it's ugly, it's gray. It needs to be seared. You need to get a crust on it. It's also the same way with smoking. So it's really not a complete overall cooking method in itself, but it works really well when you mix it with other cooking methods. So it can cook something totally perfect to the perfect temperature you can take it out at a longer time at that same exact temperature and make it more tender, which you can't do any other way. You mix it with the smoker, that gives you the smoke, the bark, that um, you know outdoorsy flavor that everybody loves. And now you got something you can't, you couldn't make with either one of these two cooking methods on their own, but if you mix them together, you can make something totally new. All right, so let's talk about in-depth, uh, and I've hit on it a couple different times, really not too much on the show, unfortunately, but in some other ventures. You had mentioned medium-rare beef ribs and medium-rare brisket, and mm -hmm. I, I would venture to say that the vast audience here is probably like, what the hell does that even mean? Like, if I cut into a medium-rare brisket, is it going to look like a medium-rare steak? And how does you get over the whole mind F that's happening? Because a lot of us are conditioned to look at what a brisket should be. The crowning one would be like a Franklin's uh, brisket or something along these lines. So how do you go about starting with a whole brisket raw and then kind of take it from there, trimming it up and how you get it through the whole sous vide portion and then how you would finish it in the smoker? And what kind of a time commitment are we really looking at? Yeah, and like I said, one of the things I like to do is I like to make things totally different than – I'm not looking to replace traditional barbecue sure. with sous vide. I'm, I'm trying to make something totally different. So to go about with a brisket, let's just say a, a full pack of brisket, which I've done you know, plenty of those, you would trim in the, most of the outside fat off. You know, you don't need that quarter of an inch because you don't need the buffer for the uh, smoker and all that. Um, you don't need it to, you know, render out in the smoker and, and protect the meat. So you trim most of the outside fat and even most of the decal out and you season it up with whatever you want, salt, pepper, you know, salt, pepper, garlic, whatever rub you want to use. 
throw it in a bag, put it in the sous vide, and you cook it for 36 to 48 hours oh. at, let's say, if you wanted medium rare. Um, with something as fatty as a beef ribs or brisket, I would do like a 135 to 136 Fahrenheit for 36 to 48 hours. Take it out of the bag, chill it in an ice bath for you know a good hour or so. Um, you can even put it in the refrigerator overnight. Then you take it out of the bag and you leave it as wet as possible. You don't pat it dry like you would a steak. You're not trying to get the moisture off. You want to leave it on. Mm -hmm. Put a little bit more seasoning on. Put it on the smoker at your desired temp. And then you let it slowly come back up to the temp that you cooked it at. So let's say 135 or 136. And then you take it off, cut it open, and then you got a medium rare brisket. Something you couldn't make, like I said before, with, with just a smoker or on the sous vide itself. Now you got... The moisture on the meat actually attracts the smoke, and since the meat is cold, it's going to attract the smoke to it. And then you're going to have something, like I said, you're going to have that smoky taste, but you're going to also look at it and go, hey, this is not well done. <laughs> so it's something totally different than a traditional, you know, uh, brisket that you would get at a, 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 a barbecue restaurant or going to a competition, that's for sure. Do you have to adjust your mind then on how it is going to taste? Or will it taste the same? No, it's going to taste different. I mean, just like a, a well-done steak would taste different than a, a medium rare steak because you're going to have different, you know, uh, amounts of myoglobin left in there and the, the color, your, your eyes are going to play a part of it as well. So it's not going to be as, you know, smoky because it hasn't sat in a smoker for, you know, 12 to 14 hours. And, and develop that really thick uh, layers on it that it has, but you're still going to be able to, I guess it's something totally different that you can't get either way. And I like to eat my food, you know, different ways. I, you know, I don't eat just, you know, barbecue chicken. I like fried chicken. I like, you know, Chinese, you know, uh, you know chicken wings. <laughs> I like all different kinds of stuff. So to me, it's just another thing that I can make and create that really wasn't available before, you know, CV came on the, uh, on the, uh, playing field so and to mix these things and like i said i i, I do not just that but i mean that you can do is keep your, your meat because you're cooking it at a right up to a precise temperature you're cooking it at a water bath so that it's um, transferring the heat into the the protein a lot uh, easier than it would be in an air uh, smoker or oven so there's a lot of things that sous vide does and that it can do really well that when you mix it with other cooking methods, it, it turns out really good. Now get back to the steak we're talking about. Now, maybe a, a ribeye, you know, if you're going to compare a reverse to a sous vide steak and then uh, grilled. But if you take, let's say, a top sirloin, that's maybe a little bit less tender. You know, it's a little bit more tough. If you give that a little bit more time in the sous vide bath, let's say six to eight to ten hours at uh, 135, and then hit that on the grill and sear it up compared to just cooking one on the grill or reverse searing it. You're going to get that tenderization that you wouldn't have got in a, just a reverse searing it. So I can have with me CV and, and no cooking method is the best for everything. So, but CV does some things that some other cooking methods don't do that when you mix them with others, it, it turns out some pretty good stuff. Have you done sous vide on, St. Louis style ribs? And if so, how do you oh, yeah. find those mm -hmm. to be? Like, how do you do that? Uh, I'd make a traditional uh, barbecue type rib. I would cook those for 36 hours at like 145 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And what, what you're doing is, you know, you're slowly, you just low and slow, just like you would be on a, on a smoker, but even lower and slower, but you're, you're, Heating the you, the heat is going into the the meat a lot more efficient. So and it's keeping it at that one temperature, you know, 140 degrees. When you cook something in a smoker, it may say it's 250 degrees on that thermometer, but it's always fluctuating in there. It's probably going from 220 to 275 at any given minute, but that thermometer is not catching all of that. Right. But when you're in a water bath, you're exactly at the temperature you're cooking at for as long as you're in there. So it, it lets you cook at a lot lower temperature. It keeps more moisture in the meat because your muscle fibers and the protein fibers aren't contracting as much, squeezing out as much moisture. And um, so it does some things like that. The longer you're in there, the more it tenderizes 
So you're using that long time to tenderize the meat. Then you go ahead, take it off and put it on the smoker. And you only have to have it on the smoker just enough to get some bark and smoke and cut them up and they're done. <laughs> uh, so, the, I mean, the biggest thing that you got to work with, I mean, aside from some of the visual stuff uh, on, the, on the beef itself, but some of the other stuff is just making sure you're allotting yourself two and three days to do the initial cooking. So if you want to have, you know, ribs on a Saturday, you're going to have to start soaking them on a Thursday, potentially. Yeah, but that also lets you pre-prep your stuff as well. So if you say you're going to have a party on Saturday, you can actually get all the stuff cooked on Thursday and Friday, toss it in the refrigerator, wake up Saturday morning and just toss your ribs on and uh, just warm them up on the smoker and um, then you're ready to go. You're not having to spend your seven or eight hours, you know, going back and forth, you know, checking on your ribs every five minutes. So you can pre-prep a lot of stuff. And I do that a lot as well. I'll cook, um, you know, I'll, I'll cook, you know, 30 pounds of pork butt in the sous vide and I'll let it just sit there for two or three days in the sous vide. I don't have to mess with it, take it out, put it in the refrigerator. The next day I'll smoke it and then I'll package it up and put it in the, in the freezer and just pull it out whenever I want it, you know, for meals. So there's a lot of things you can do like that with, for meal prep and everything. Um, so sous vide is a lot more versatile than just and it's like I said, it's not trying to replace a cooking method. It's actually just uh, a, an incomplete cooking method that can do some things. And if you mix it with others, it makes some really great food. So, And you have a book that talks all about this sous vide cooking. So go ahead and give us a look at yeah. that. And then uh, where can we get it if we want to check it out? You can get it on Amazon. And you said it was an ebook, but it's actually you can get it on the Kindle paperback or hardcover oh. on Amazon. And actually I'm having a... Uh, I lowered the price on it this week um, just for a new year special. So you can get the uh, uh, Kindle version for like four ninety nine, or if you've got Kindle unlimited, you can get it, download it and read it for free. And if you want to buy it, you can. And then uh, the paperback is twelve ninety nine. And if you go to my website, fire and water cooking.com, you can actually go there and order. I'll, I'll sign one for you and send it to you for um, tw- uh, twenty two ninety nine for the hard copy. Nice. But um, I actually go into, I break down, I go into barbecue, kind of go over a, like a, you know, a overhead view of, of barbecue. I go into some details because I usually, I'll talk to people that don't have much knowledge of barbecue and a lot of people that don't have much knowledge of sous vide. So I kind of do an overhead view of both barbecue, outdoor cooking, and then sous vide cooking, and then show how you can mix them together. And then there's about 40 recipes in there nice. that um, kind of break down the techniques that I do have uh, developed over the years. So, all right. Well, if you are getting into this for 2021 and you want the definitive source, then get Darren's book for crying out loud. I'll sign it for you uh, over at fire and water cooking.com. If you get the hardback. So uh, check it out, Darren, appreciate you coming on and breaking down sous vide and we will have you on again. And uh, maybe we can break down some specific meats and, and times and techniques and all that good stuff. Sure. I don't know. Did me ever tell you we're both on the International Sous Vide Association? No, of course board, he so. didn't. I mean, you yeah, know, he's, yeah. he's got so many <laughs> stories. We probably just haven't yeah. hit that one yet. So, uh, well, that's well, good. actually, yeah, he, he, he was a, a, a speaker at the uh, International Sous Vide Summit two years in a row. I was one this year. So we, we kind of hosted some nice. stuff and we've gone back and forth. I've had him on my podcast as well. And we've discussed this stuff. And like I said, you know, there, you know, sous vide is not going to replace a cooking method. And cooking methods aren't really fighting each other. They're just, there's ways you can use them just like a tool, just like you would use a spatula or a, That's right. uh, any, other, any other kind of barbecue tool. You use your cooking methods to uh, help produce some great food. And there's ways you can do it with, with both of them. Darren, appreciate the time. Thanks so much. All righty. Thanks, Greg. You got it. There he is, Darren Wilson from fireandwatercooking.com. And you can grab his book on Amazon, you can go ahead over to fireandwatercooking.com and grab a paperback, or you can get the hardcover and he will sign it. I think it was the most, 22 bucks or whatever it was, so easy. You got a lot of money for Christmas, so go ahead and check that out if you are into or thinking about getting into the sous vide stuff. Who's not? Medium rare brisket. What? I said medium rare brisket and beef ribs. I'm moderately intrigued. 
the thing that pulls me out of being really motivated is the 48 hour thing. I'm afraid I would just forget about it. But I'm kind of a dope that way anyway. All right, let me talk to you quickly about Pits and Spits. Since 1983, Pits and Spits has been handcrafting smokers and grills in Houston, Texas, establishing itself as a premier brand in high quality offsets and pellet cookers. Seven and 10 gauge steel in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit, three or four stainless roll top lids and front shelves on every single smoker. Does it matter? Yes, using quality material matters to Pits and Spits. Helps you reach and maintain temperatures. You can worry more about the meat than the heat. You don't have to worry about smoke or grease leaking out of the barrel or rattling apart as you move it through the yard. It's all solid stuff. You can pass it down to your kids for crying out loud. Now, while some of the other companies are focusing on low cost, Pits and Spits focuses on craftsmanship using quality materials. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control of the design and standards. Their steel suppliers give you material that can be used in some of the harshest conditions around so you know they're going to perform anywhere in the country. Pits and Spits is a dealer network across the country, but if you don't have one close to you, call Koi in the shop. Tell them I told you to call 844-650-6250, 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master or a competition team, Pits and Spits has a product for you. You can check them out on the website, pitsandspits.com, all spelled out. Or you can see their pits in the wild across social media with our handle at Pits and Spits. Once again, all spelled out there. All right, we're back to wrap the first hour. Stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. This portion of the show is brought to you by Fireboard 2, Fireboard 2 Drive, and Fireboard 2 Pro. That's the thermocouple version, by the way. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via the Bluetooth. And if you have Alexa or Google Assistant in your home, you're in luck because Fireboard is fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. Somebody was asking about uh, disease or bacteria growing. We have an answer for that from Darren Wilson. The meat pasteurizes at lower temps with time. Of course, we know that, right? When you do chicken, if you want to have the finished temperature at 155 or 140. I don't know why you would want to have a finished temperature at 145 on chicken, but if you want to, just go to the FDA website and it will tell you, hold chicken at 145 for this amount of time and the meat will be safe. Remember, the FDA recommends our instantaneous annihilation of the ickies, as Meathead would say. So 165 immediate elimination but at 155 you might need to do it for x amount of time longer and it's got to be at that temperature it can't start to fall off that's key as well so time and temp get you safe meat in case you didn't know that so we thank darren wilson again once again the website fire and water cooking Dot com. If you want to grab his book, you can do it on Amazon. You can do a paperback on the website. You can also do a hardcover that he will sign. I am Harry Sue. That's exactly right. <laughs> my uh, footprint in my backyard is minimal. It's not. It's actually very, it's, it's a big footprint. Many different cookers. All right, we might have an ear update for you. We might have a cat piss update for you. I said we might have a cat piss update for you. We'll also promo episode 158 of the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less coming up at the top of the second hour. With some other things to get to as well before we get to Sam the Cooking Guy. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central show. Right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. We'll be right back. 